coming up. And what the hell? It's got five, that's got five digits. That's exactly what we've seen. He's come from over there, out of the water. That's a thylacine. What do you got? The following expedition was filmed over a nine day period in a very remote and rarely visited region on the island of Tasmania. But before we unbox this epic adventure, it would not be out of place to properly introduce the subject of its investigations. This being the Tasmanian tiger, or thylacine. Once fairly well distributed throughout the island of Tasmania, the thylacine was an apex predator. But joining the likes of the indigenous tribes, southern right whales and softwood hill and pine, European settlement quickly saw them become increasingly rare. While some say their demise was inevitable, others believe they never left us. But no matter what your opinion on them is, the thylacine was, or still is, an outcast in its own state. The first bounty to be laid on the thylacine was by the Van Diemen's Land Company in 1830. In fear of loss of sheep stock occupying their 250,000 acres of cleared land in the northwest of the island. It is uncertain how many thylacines were killed in the decades to follow, but as more and more settlers cleared land and added livestock, it seemed only to draw them out in higher numbers. But could it be that what they were witnessing was not the lure of some new food, but a result caused by the disruption of an ancient practice? The Tasmanian Aboriginals were made up by many separate groups who at the end of the last ice age were cut off from the mainland of Australia by the flooding of Bass Strait. They developed a signature hunting style, which consisted of setting fire to the vast plains, which sprouted fresh green shoots and attracted game. This practice would have undoubtedly benefited the thylacine, whose hunting style and diet was similar to the Aboriginals. But in the early 1800s, the colonization of the state by Europeans saw them fighting for their land and after 26 years of conflict, the Black War finally came to an end, when a treaty was made by key Aboriginal chief Mangalajina, and the remaining 200 indigenous were resettled to Flinders Island. Throughout the next 80 years, thousands of thylacines would be hunted, snared and slaughtered, encouraged by the state offering a one pound per head bounty, which at the time was equivalent to one month's salary. When the bounty period ceased in 1909, the thylacine was rarely seen anymore, but it was not until July 1936 that it was finally granted protection. At the time, there was just one remaining specimen left in captivity, Benjamin, who would sadly pass away due to exposure on the 7th of September that year. The animal would continue to make headlines in years to follow, as thousands of reports stacked up, building a huge database of sightings. It is of my opinion that if thylacines are to still be alive, they must be where they were known to exist before European activity, in a habitat that has remained largely unchanged, and most importantly, the area must continue to supply a good source of game and shelter. One such area that ticks all these boxes is south of the west coast, and as I began to research the very limited human history of the area, I began to realise that this was no pipe dream. Bob Thomas, who was a member of a short-lived logging operation down at the Spiro River, talks about his experience after fishing on its shores. And we're walking along the shore, going back at night time, the Tasmanian tiger would follow us, about 20 or 30 feet behind us. And I stopped one night behind other chaps and saw this, this thing with two pups there. And we used to go back there quite frequently afterwards, looking for fish and trying to catch fish and crayfish, mostly with our hands, of course. And we found the lair where this thing used to live. We were, we were struck by the storm on one occasion. We were looking for shelter for ourselves and found the, where this thing had its lair and camped in a, in a sandy bank, it was. And uh, that's about 1938. So I've always thought that if anyone really wanted a uh, Tasmanian tiger, that, that would be the place I'd look for them down there. Further research led me to the Hobart archives, where I discovered an old letter from 1937 addressed to trooper Arthur Fleming who at the time was leading the state-run expeditions to try to find the thylacine. The writer says this about his friend. This last few months he has been to the Jane River prospecting. He tells me there are plenty of tigers there, but the best place he has seen has been the Spiro. He says it is nothing to see three or four of a morning on the beach, about daylight. 
When World War II broke out, the Spiro job was abandoned, and the area has since remained isolated from the advancements of mankind with one exception. In 1950, a track was laid down from Birch's Inlet to build and service the low Rocky Point Lighthouse. But this track has long been abandoned and lies about 15 kilometers east from the Spiro. Using this track, I plan to make my way to the river, where I'll pack raft down its majestic hewn pine studded banks and set up a base camp, from which I can thoroughly investigate the area for any sign there might still be the elusive thylacine waiting to be found. So the time is 7.40, December 3rd. 2022 and I'm about to leave head down to Strawn where I'm gonna be getting on Southwest Expeditions boat heading to Sarah Island and then in the dinghy from there to Birch's Inlet where I'll make tracks <clears throat> head down to the Spiro but before all of that I did extend an invite to this trip and uh, Someone was silly enough to accept it. He has no idea where we're going, but he's gonna be here in 20 minutes and I'll fill him in. He knows that we're going to look for thylacines. We've got a week and he needs to bring his pack raft. Who do you think it could be? Now I've gotta say, you're a bit of a mad dog. Who the hell signs well, up for a week long trip in the Southwest without knowing where they're going? Especially when it's Rob, it's like, I was like, this could be anything. <laughs> yeah, it could be. It's a pretty cool itinerary. A mm. um, bit of pining history, very remote area. Um, we're gonna be, history. the plan today is we're meeting. Sounds like a Gordon River cruise. Similar, yeah. Right. So we're driving now to Strawn, where we're gonna meet Sam Gerardy, who right helped on. with the headstone with Ron and Oh Dan. yeah. So they've got Southwest Expeditions, yep. which is like a charter company um, yep. for rafters and stuff right. so they're gonna pick some rafters up down on the Gordon tomorrow morning but they're gonna drop us off at Birch's Inlet which is in the south of Macquarie Harbour yep um, just south basically direct south from Sarah Island oh wow so we're gonna get dropped off there and there used to be a track that ran from Birch's Inlet all the way down to Rocky Low uh, low Rocky Point where they built yep. a lighthouse in the 50s. Oh cool. The bridges are all out on it but we're gonna follow that track for about 10 k's and then we're gonna get to the Spiro River. Oh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Which is why we need the pack rafts. I've always wanted to go there actually. Don't forget your plaster of Paris too mate. I'm not lugging that in there for you. <laughs> Once in Strawn we dropped off the car at the Croswell residence. Move on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks again and headed down to the pier to meet the Garrity brothers, who have just started up this epic charter company offering all sorts of remote transport options. Yes. 
best view. This is insane. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how you get from Turner's Beach to the Spiro River in one day. Yeah, after the pack. So it's like a hot spring, hey? Yeah, you fly off a Tassie. Because it's just been baking all day. Yeah, like there's so much river rock and the sun's been out all day. Oh, damn, dude. We're living like kings out here. <laughs> well, uh, there are a few mozzies, but haven't got me yet. I think I've got a No wonder the friggin' Thilo living out here with no humans. Yeah, he found the big spot of the So where do you think you'd be spending the first night? Where did I think? Mm. Um, as in before I knew where we were going. Yeah. No idea. Really? No. I thought maybe it was just another J mission. Shit. On the Urbis. This is so different to the Erebus though, isn't it? Yeah, like absolutely. Like space. This, this is so yeah. different to the game altogether. Mm. Well, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, we've never really seen that many animals in the game. Mm -hmm. what, like, why would you want to... I love the place, don't get me wrong, but it's not very livable. Mm -hmm. This has got more, I think the coast, I think you're on the money with the coast, mm. where the river meets the coast, in a remote area. History, history that's said that they've seen them here and they're quite credible stories mm. in the 30s before they were extinct. The following morning we woke to a foggy, barren landscape, packed up our gear and began tracing the Spiro River downstream looking for a deep enough point to enter with the rafts. We were still over 25 kilometers from the coast and figured we probably wouldn't make it there within one day, least of all not knowing what kind of obstacles lay before us.
that a kingfisher? Just hit the rainforest. Myrtles, man ferns, and wild Bigfoots. Look at the root system on it at the base. It's learned to cope with the uh, flooding and... Beautiful, like, graceful leaves on it, isn't it? Yeah, definitely a female. But, um, yeah, I've never seen them that kind of fine. Interesting. Oh, and that one, there's a male that you're going past now. Kind of a little bit shorter, a bit more spiky, and generally a little bit rougher. That's how you tell the difference between a male and female human. And as beautiful and seductive as a rainforest can be, floating down a river on a pack rafting journey, one learns to never get too comfortable. NRS here. NRS. Yeah. Oh, God. oh man, that's gonna my turn, hey? Ooh, Rob. Luckily for me, Levi is well experienced in patching up rafts, oh, and we set out to try taping it back together. You're the pro, mate. Looks all right. Be going. Well, after a nice little patch of excitement and some lunch, we're back on the water. Thanks to Levi's expertise, craftsmanship. Seems to have worked, eh? Oh yeah. Good as you. Yep. No bubbles or nothing coming out of it. After a couple more hours on the water, we pulled in on a gravel bar and set up camp. My home for the night was in forests, amongst a stunning stand of Hewans. Levi opting for the more beachside type of real estate. Afterwards, we went exploring to find a suitable place to set up the trail cameras. Oh yeah, look at that. Rip a little game trail. Something definitely walked along there. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> we'll come back. Oh, look, this is where the pine yeah, is. Yeah, cut some. Cut some hewans. Here too. Look, there's one just sitting on the side. Those two there, I reckon. Yep. Could be the... You can yeah, see the, yeah. the square where they've cut them with the axe. <laughs> Cleaned them up. Yeah. Take out. Well, that's the tops Just on. the rubbish. The, yeah, yeah, the tops. Once again, the tops on. Freaking insane wood, though. Like, if yeah. you had that back oh. home, yeah, thousands of probably bars. thousands of bucks. bucks. Yeah. How could he resist this? 
He's going to smell this from about 6 k's away and go... It's just wafting straight down the river. Straight down there. He's going to smell it. He's going to come straight to the cameras. Should be pretty good. So we've got this big open area. So where are we going to put the bait? Maybe back like at least 2 metres. But it'd be cool if he got up on his back legs. Yeah. Yeah. Right, eh? <laughs> I like it. <laughs> um, hopefully that's low enough. I don't think they're that wide. Maybe throw the um, bait back about a metre. Yeah. Yep, that'll be good. All right, I'll set these suckers and we'll get out of here. Expect anything less. Night one of the trail cameras proved disappointing, not a single trigger on either camera. But this information gave us valuable insight that it was much more likely that game would be concentrated closer to the coast, which we were aiming to arrive at by day's end.
I've just left Levi. He's going to have a bit of a snooze on the riverbank in the sun. And I'm trying to find the old Piner's camp. Which was apparently three or four miles upstream up the river mouth. It's like a bit of a track maybe ran through here. bottle long neck this could be close to the camp for sure just come across some iron and some sleepers I noticed these sticking out and I noticed that one as well and you can just tell that it was part of something and yep sure enough the irons here although I wasn't expecting any iron because I knew it was a hewn pine hut but it looks like later on they've added iron for a roof. I don't know what that is, maybe the fireplace. But this must have been the original structure. Is that more of it here? Yeah, yeah, definitely, look. You can see the nails there through that one. Those two nails, the back of them, completely rusted on the other side, but you can make them out. Better go wake Levi up and tell him that I found it because he's snoozing. After a quick wake up call, Levi was on his feet and stoked to walk around the old campsite. The Piners who built this camp nearly 100 years ago were the Nielsens, who split the Huon Pine into palings for the sides and roof of this hut. I later found out that the iron used was to line the inside of the chimney as to protect it from fire. The Piners used horses to drag the heavy logs to the river, and we found splendid tracks running along the side of the river which they used to traverse, some which still contain old bridges. Like this one here over a gully. Yeah, you can just see it's totally collapsed. We were now close to the coast, and as we paddled downstream, the river gradually deepened as the rainforest converted to scrub. Here we are, look. Southern Ocean. This is such a prime spot to set up for the experiments because we've got the night vision binoculars. So from this side, we can see what's happening on the northern side of the, of the river, along the beachy area, without interfering directly. Okay, so we've decided that we're gonna settle in here at this camp spot that Levi found. We've got a couple of drums that are kicking around that we can use for seats on the campfire. Fresh water coming down by the river. Levi's just gone out to uh, try and catch some cray. And then I'm set up here with an epic view of the beach over in Spiro Bay. So it doesn't really get much better than this. Now it's time to get the fire going, settle in, and then wait for twilight when we can pull out the night vision binoculars and uh, see how we go from there. While Levi took off to go fishing, I settled into our new headquarters, and after a successful catch, dinner was served. Who would have thought that we'd be sitting here on the, the Spiro lookout, eating crayfish. eating crayfish? I had no idea this like even existed, this little perch. Mm. It's so prime. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's got that kind of like bush ranger or bandit hangout. <laughs> like it's so hidden in here. Yeah. 
a bit of a pirate pirate, pirate hangout. Pirate tower, I think the whiskey bottle set it off the As the sun started to drop, it was time to set up my trail cameras using the seafood leftovers. So we paddled over the Spiro to investigate potential sites. Look at those prints. Uh, they go up there. So we've got this little trail here that runs around the outside of the bank. I'll set this one up here. That's nice and tight there, man. So if you want to pop some snacks down for old Stripey. Oh yeah. Give him some of the good stuff too, homie. Give him the good stuff. Oh hell, that's what he's talking about. <laughs> Maybe here, Levi. Yeah. yeah, I reckon. I reckon we'll set it up here because it looks like something lives up there. Right. And the guy said that the um, thought they found the thylers there, and it was in a sandy bank. Yeah, right. ready she's sturdy as too Good. yeah footprints probably not the smartest thing we've done but it's only footprints it's only footprints and it's only sand yeah well there's nothing we can do about it no right. we're gonna leave prints the best thing is like the thing that we've got on our side here is we can see that this footprints going up there yeah. it's some sort of little track the guy said that they lived in a sandy bank like this is prime Having a crack, that's all it is. It's just a waiting game now, mate. Yeah, it is. Sitting. You see, the way the thylacine normally gets his kill is to wear his prey down. And that's the way we're going to get him. He's sitting in his den going, Nah, you're not gonna fool me that easy, boys. He doesn't realise that tomorrow there's even bigger crayfish. <laughs> <laughs> and two of them. <laughs> the following morning fared well, and after a quick breakfast, we began making our way over to the cameras. But halfway over we were stopped when I noticed we had received a visitor during the night. Look at him, trailing along. This type of pattern, I know this type of pattern is a signature, but I'm not sure if it's tiger. It's like, it's like a lightning bolt, right? Every four has this pattern. You see? Look at him. First of all, first of all he was coming towards us. <laughs> he made his way towards us. And then came back the other way. Look, you can see this, the watermark. See that? He's come up. He's come up out of the water. He's come from over there, out of the water, 
and he's wet and he's dripping along. See these drops, they're all fresh. And then the droplets, you had a bit of a shake here. And then it turns into the pads and the claw marks and heads towards us. I don't know, could very well be devil. I'm not gonna rule it out. But there is a small percentage that that's a thylacine. Let's go check these trail cams. Here, this is where they lead in. This will, this will tell you exactly where they came from. Dude, whatever this is, I think we've captured it on. Look, it's it's heading towards the trail cam. If this, <laughs> we'll find out, won't we, mate? Look at that. Yeah. Look at those. Yeah. Oh. Oh, oh, what? The trail cam's been knocked over. The trail, what in the hell? Trail cam's been knocked over. Yeah, look at this. What's dragged? You're kidding. Something's got into it. Oh, turd, look. Yep. Twisted tile of turd. Maybe. It's been snapped in half the post itself. No, no, that's the one. You broke that off, drove that into the ground, didn't you? How did it drop out? Look, he's hit because he's knocked it. He's come straight over. He's, oh. he's knocked the trail cam. Look at the trail here. And oh. the paws. He's dragged oh. through there. You're kidding. The tail. That's the tail there. 4 a.m. What do you got? Oh, no. Ah, oh, devil. It's a devil. Okay, all right, well, let's all play right. this. Oh, listen to the noise. Ah, ah look at him. That's, he, he could sniff everything on your... Sniff your hands out on it. They must have the awesome scent. Sense of smell. They get into everything, don't they? That cheeky thing. It's a wonder this is still here. Mm. Lucky you didn't drag it off to the ocean. Going for the cray though, because the shell's been knocked off the stick. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Well, there's a very healthy looking devil devil kicking about, which is an all right sign. Mm. This place is not void of life. No. I'm surprised actually, like it's good to see the devils out. Eating, yeah. Eating their dinner. We got a little bit excited over nothing though, which sucks. Yeah, only night one. It is only night one. We got plenty more traps and things to do. We need some more crane meat. <laughs> yeah, they love that <laughs> stuff. While Levi went for a stroll down the coast looking for cray holes, I went exploring for an old piner's camp I had read about in Gary Kerr's book, A Hewan Pine Story. 
The camp was rediscovered in the 90s during a pine salvage operation by Chris Short and his team and was apparently on the south side of the river just inside the mouth. Short noted there were signs of horses being there, horseshoes, stables and blackberries. Gotta be close. It's too clear and too flat not to utilize. Like if not here, then where? That's the question. Oh, here we go, a little bottle. Here's another one. I don't know if that's old enough. Same situation, like prime camp, but just nothing to symbolize that it was the spot. Come on, where's the blackberries and stable? All these pieces here that have been cut. Ronnie Morrison's just sent me in this on the sat phone. He said, Rob, still think Jack Chesterman may be correct. When he, as a young deckhand on a cray boat in 1956, took the hue and pine from the corral stables on the north side. My assumption was it would need to be near a creek. There are two creeks. Good water for horses north of the first rock outcrop at the end of beach. Interesting. Because Ronnie was in here in 86, I think. He, uh, he camped here for a week. And he never found the stables and the campsite that Chris Short talked about when he came here in the 90s and did the salvaging operation. I was picking... Uh, Ronnie's brain about it because it was obviously somewhere that I wanted to see when I came down here along with uh, Nelson's camp too which he put me in the right direction of. Calling it quits for the day I went and checked on Levi who I found swimming in a sheltered cray hole just outside our camp. Down the legs, both hands. Even with the gloves on? Mm, just straight through the gloves. They were real aggressive. Like no other craze I've tackled, everything down here is just full of life like nowhere else. It's just untamed yeah, country. Way bigger than yesterday's one, hey? Yeah. These are, these are about mid-size. They can grow up to like six kilos. Just been walking, backtracking along the southern side of the Spiro again, and I found these two bottles. What got me onto them was I followed a track in there and it started going up the hill. And uh, I didn't explore it too much, but it looked like a, a decent little track, patchy in places, but still a bit worn. And then I thought I'll, I'll mark it and then I'll come back out. And right where I came out, I found these two bottles. So this could actually be a hot zone to explore uh, a little further with Levi. 
he's just sleeping at the moment and I came down to get a couple of bits of wood off the beach but um, this whole like stable things kind of been doing my head in and Chris Short said it was on the southern side of the bank and I've searched so much but sometimes you just got to search a little harder and that's what I'm trying to do but anyway I found those two bottles I'm going to take the timber back to Levi it's only like five o'clock um, and I'll come back down and have a, a, a gaze. You reckon she's old? They're the same as the Jane River ones. Are they? Aren't they? That's what I thought. 30s? Yeah. Yeah, so I found one in there and then another right there. You can see where they were, both the same age. And I came from like. Yeah, it does. I reckon work our way back from where those bottles were. I reckon work our way inwards from where those bottles were. We've searched this ground a lot and found nothing. But how could they not camp here when they came here in the 90s? Yeah, like this is fine open area. Mm. been so all over this ground and just can't find anything to say that this was the camp it's so frustrating <coughs> I've just found something new It looks like, was that together or separate? Okay, that is some sort of seat. This is something. That, that's something for sure. It's an old paling. Oh, this is gonna be it. I've got to be onto it. I've got to be onto it. I have to be. That. That's the only thing that I've found. Oh, something over there. What's that? It's an old seat. Seats collapse. Look at that. They've done a good job crafting it. All done with the axe. Check out that nail that they've sent through it. Okay, this is starting to make sense. This is, I think this is what's happened. So, the Piners were here in 1930. While they were here, they crafted this seat with an ax and nails. And that was there. Then when Chris Short and his team came in the 90s with the chainsaws, they saw that. And they also saw the horseshoes and blackberries and everything else we've been trying to find. But while they were here, 
because I remember him saying it was so nice when we were at the camp we felt like the same as what the Piners would have been like the old timers while they were here they crafted their own seats with chainsaws and this one here with chainsaw see the difference in the nails so they've added to the camp that pretty much verifies it for me I mean I would love to see a blackberry bush I would love to see a horseshoe but the fact that there's two separate seats from different decades is more than enough for me I still haven't figured out this thing story I think that's got to be part of the old stable. Look at those holes there. Could they be? What do you reckon? Oh, look at that. Look at that nail. Or what's left of it. Yep, yeah, she's part of a building for sure. But it's just sitting out here randomly. This cleared area, almost square, just outside of where the seats are, must have been the stables. Listen. You can hardly hear any wind. It's all the way up in the hills. This is so protected for the horses. There's got to be a shoe around. Look at this, they left all their supplies. All the pots and pans. Levi's going to spew because he gave up about an hour ago and went back to camp. <laughs> uh, now he has to come out again to see what I found. Mate, I only find stuff when you leave. <laughs> That's how it always goes. It's like, oh, I better go get Levi because he'll want to be part of he'll this. He'll want to film this. And then you come along and you give it 10 minutes and you Mate, throw the I sack in. I was out there. I was still out there for a good 45 minutes after I lost you. I was like, thank God he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so night number two, trail cam number two, I'm directed straight into this little cove on the side of the sea, potentially a lot of animal activity coming from the dunes. The next morning we woke to more sun, although we had been warned a storm was due to hit later on. First thing on the agenda was to check the cameras. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think the tail's been eaten. Unfortunately for this camera, I had no clip showing what had moved the crayfish, but hundreds of shots without it moved. So I've just figured out what's happened. The memory card became full because it was doing all those false triggers at camp and then also overnight, the memory card filled up. So we don't have footage of whatever it was that ate the cray tail. I'm gonna have to go through and just delete those camp ones and yeah, there's nothing else we can do about that. What it, whatever it was, we missed it. Mm. Nothing for this one. Nothing. Okay. Levi's just come back from the toilet area. And look what he's found here. He seemed to have a habit of finding skulls that have big teeth on them. Yeah. For those that remember that video, but yeah, no, I was just going to the toilet this time and got this one. Huge teeth on it. Massive teeth. Thinking seal though this time. Mm. The eye sockets look like they're very yeah. far up in the something to skull. The, something to do with the. Uh, in a little. Oh no, that's it right there. That's the socket. It looks like a dinosaur, man. It's crazy. What the hell? After lunch, we followed the coast south and filled up our water with a crystal clear stream Levi had come across previously. Although windy, the day was hot and we utilized the time to have a refreshing dip in the ocean. Back at camp, with the rain now drawing closer, we set up our hoochie flies in anticipation. Due to the weather, I opted to set the cameras up in a more sheltered spot, in a forest just over the hill from our camp, where there were good animal trails. The rain's here. It's gonna bring the thylers out onto the beach. It's freaking freezing and it's been raining for like a few hours now. I'm about to fall asleep and get a good night's rest. I'm going to get up uh, pretty early tomorrow. I've been getting up at 5.30 and checking the beach, but I feel like I want to get up at least 5, maybe 4.30 and just get down to the beach while it's still dark and then scope out the beach with a night vision binoculars. Uh, the plan tomorrow, tomorrow's Thursday, we're getting picked up on Sunday, so we've still got three whole days. Gonna check the trail cams and potentially, if there's nothing on them, uh, move north of the Spiro Bay. So we're gonna, yeah, probably kiss this place goodbye, but we'll figure that out tomorrow.
videos. Oh, at least it wasn't trigger it all right. It's yeah. a start. Here's a 9. 9.15. Can't see anything in that one. Good. I mean, with the rain and stuff, it was a good spot because the lens is still clean. Yeah. And they're still working. So last night, Rob set the trail cam up over the back of the point here in this rut. Uh, it was a ferocious night last night, so I don't know if I've went. I don't know, probably a bit triggered by everything that we've been moving in motion. Doesn't what do you make of this? It doesn't look like oh, Hang on, maybe it does look like this. Like a spirit or something in the middle. So, what? Fluffy. Ooh. See that? It's floating. Watch it. Yeah, I can see it. Look at that. It goes up. It's a little white bar or something moving up from there. Yeah. We've got spirit setting off the trail camps now. Oh, I tell you what, it's certainly got that feel here, doesn't it? Mm. Everything about this place, like. Got a feel about it, UV. And this one shot nothing, no spirits. Yeah, I reckon we head up the coast today. All that rain on the sand. Fresh tracks about. After breakfast, we broke camp and began packing up our gear. Of course, the fire had to be properly extinguished, and we repaired our spot as to leave no trace. We'll never even know we were here. The sea was now quite rough, along with the wind, and we anticipated walking a few kilometres to find some creeks we had noticed on the map. Along the way we came across an assortment of items, including a data boy, some giant rib bones, and what looked to be the ruin of some old shelter. I found it quite depressing the amount of plastic that had washed up on the shore. Most of it was from overseas. Perhaps in the future we could organise a multi-day trip where we band together and clean up what we can. Further on, we came across these amazing rocks. Each one was so bizarrely unique and reminded me of different galactical scenes. We named them Space Rock Beach. The first creek we arrived at had a delicate waterfall at the shore, but the lack of shelter forced us to pursue further up the coast. After the second creek was no better, we both looked at each other and realised the mistake we had made. On the return trip we came across some interesting impressions in the mud and a decision was made to leave one camera for the night, although it was miles from camp. We're back. <laughs> <laughs> Look who came crawling back. Eight kilometers later and we're back. Oh 10 k's it was. 10 k's. Yeah, it was five, five to where we stopped. Another five back. I had a weird feeling when we were leaving here that there was more to be done here. And I was also thinking, if Bob Thomas found the lair of this thylacine that lived here then, then that wouldn't be that far away from the Spiro River. I read a report before I came here that said that the home range for each thylacine would be no less than 25 squared kilometers which is five by five kilometers so if there was a tiger close to the Spiro River close to where they were fishing then there's probably not one for another five k's or so 
which means that there's a lair somewhere around here that the guys found and it's either north of the river or it's south of the river but if one thing came from today's little expedition it was that I don't think it was on the north because it is so much walking along the sand before you get to decent areas where they could have fished so it makes so much more sense that they were always fishing on the south very close to where we were yesterday when we had the dip there's fresh running water from a creek awesome cray pools and that's all they'd need they'd come down on Saturday night fish the whole Sunday with the fresh water crays and somewhere between that creek and here I'm guessing is where they found the lair upon returning to camp I found this amazingly straight piece of wood laying on the ground which had evidently been a walking stick to someone in the past and judging by the still sticky sap bleeding out the nodes not too long ago, it contained several markings like they had been counting. Hopefully that's it for the rain. The wind seems to be dying off, but might be a little worse when we get around the corner. The cray's not as fresh tonight, so I'm going the last three rashes of bacon. I'll break the cray up too. Hopefully put a smell out there. at night time, a couple clips in the afternoon. Large feet. Notice how the pattern's different with the wombat the devil. The devil had that kind of shape like that. The wombat goes like that. I think it's a wombat anyway. Got a beautiful trail that comes down for the wallaby. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 hops on the sand 
and then takes off into the pig face. One clip, and it was through the day. Ah, it was just a bird. After breakfast, we decided to go for a look up the river to follow some of the old tracks to see if we could find any footprints. We'll go for a nice stroll and have lunch up there, eh? Mm. How good's the forest? Mm. Just come in here and be quiet for a second, just listen. No thundering ocean. Nah. And so many birds chirping away. Wow, look at this insane open forest. I think this is actually almost more beautiful than the Jane. Oh, this is a good spot to check for prints. Imagine if we found some tiger prints here. Oh. I'd lose it. I'd just straight up lose me shit right here on this spot. We found the track where the horses would come along. Straight down through here, following the river. The beautiful wide open track. About the same width as a footpath, I guess. Look at all these awesome little pandemies here. They just appear to be floating in the air like a chandelier of pandemies. Oh, you found a bridge? Oh, yep. Definitely. I'd say that we're on the track then, mate. Mm, that's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, that's wicked. Beautiful little connector. We followed the old track for several kilometres upstream and enjoyed some of the most magnificent rainforest Tasmania has to offer. Come and look at the size of this thing. That is... Huge, this has got to be at least 3,000 years old, surely. Yeah. It's so big and gnarly. It's about 10 foot wide. That is massive.
so it's Friday afternoon, it's like 4.30 or something. It was great to go down to the forest and mix things up. This whole coastline is kind of getting a little monotonous to be honest. And um, the forest was amazing to walk through there and check out some of the old horse trails. And we came back and we like, had a little dip in the river. Had a nice little exfoliating scrub with the sand and then got warm by the fire. But um, tomorrow marks the last day, the last full day, because we're out of here on Sunday morning. And I think what we're going to do is head down to Endeavour Bay, which is like a fair walk, but we're going to go down there tomorrow just to mix it up. And then, of course, in the meantime, just set the trail cam somewhere but I don't really like my chances with that we don't have any fresh cray because the water was still too murky from that storm I remember an old article I read somewhere it said when the prospectors used to get short on food they'd sit a hurricane lantern out in the middle of a field and they'd step away from it and the animals would come up to it and they reckon that if there was a tiger about, he would be the first one to come up to it. So what I think I'll do tonight is I'll set this up over on the beach, make some sort of little pyramid type thing out of driftwood and leave this over there. And then I can keep an eye on it from here. And I'll also set the trail cams up over there too. And then hopefully tomorrow we can get some fresh prey and give one last crack on the south side over here and get whatever that creature was from the other night on film. Pretty good, eh? Yeah, and just bottle it up a little bit. Absolutely nothing on that one. And a few cubs. Oh yeah, full family of tigers. Oh, that's pretty good. Full family. I was hoping for a couple of tribes. This one had a false trigger at 7.30. Seagulls flying through. Might have been the sun flare. And that was a worthless experiment.
So that point right there, I went onto that rock, climbed up that, and then tried to get up onto that. But it's very steep, and uh, we're not going to risk it because we don't know what else is around the corner. So we'll have a look back this way, see if we can find a track over the other side. And Levi pulled the pin on the Endeavour mission. He's going to stay around that side and look for Cray, I think, which leaves me solo. She's only a couple of k's away, but hopefully I can get around to it this way rather than using the cliffs. There he is down there, the big wimp. Lubing himself up to go fishing. Here's what we tried in the scope. Went around the cliff face and then got to there where it got pretty gnarly. Then went back and it went up and then tried going around the cliff face but got pretty gnarly again. That's where it got really thick and without the gaiters, it's just too risky. Like, especially being out there solo, like if I got bitten by a snake, it just be the dumbest thing being 12 hours out of being picked up out of here. <laughs> 8 k's return to Condor Point. <clears throat> the good that came out of it, I guess, is that we got to see four more kilometers of coastline. And I think it looks pretty favorable for a thylacine. It's kind of got that feel to it, that kind of like elephant graveyard from Lion King feel where the hyenas live. It's dotted with marsupial lawns and plenty of protection up in those hills as well. So it was definitely an interesting walk regardless of not making it to Ev Endeavour Bay. I can't leave this place tomorrow not knowing what the hell is up here in these sand dunes? The thing that I can't figure out about Bob Thomas's quote about we were struck by a storm on one occasion and we were looking for shelter for ourselves when they found the lair is how far away from the boat must they have been to choose a random sandy bank rather than just getting on with it wow this is insane through here look at all the ferns on this side totally different vegetation Scared the crap out of me. Yeah, totally different vegetation on this side. All man ferns, a few rainforest species as well. Everything in here screams thylacine stripes. Look at all those ferns, ferns.
going on here? Wallaby. Hey, little birdie. Wallaby. Wallaby. Something else. And something else. Wallaby. Wallaby. An amazing little area this is. Well here we go. Alright, so we've got Wallaby and I think that is Devil. Here's the thing where I struggle to comprehend that thylacines could be extinct. If there's like hundreds of thousands of acres of this type of bushland south of Macquarie Harbour where there's been little to no change in the landscape at all, there were thylacines here before they went extinct, the habitat's still here, the game's still here, I just think that they should still be here. One last go at these things. There's some, uh, there's some people around here that aren't us. Why those markings? Why would anyone leave that stick? Do you reckon it wasn't here when we got here? No. Nah. Then it was here like the second no, no, it was like it was mid mid day, uh, mid mid trip. It just popped up like it was dropped over behind that that tree. Hasn't, hasn't been touched. 